Hello all, it's Tavara Krasniansky from Adayad. And tonight we're continuing our series of working together for Shalom Bayes. Tonight's talk is about parenting together as a team. And we're very grateful for Rabbi Chase Taub to share with us on this topic. This, to uh, this call is being sponsored by the City of New York uh, to address uh, dom uh, domestic violence and other marital issues. So we're very grateful to the City of New York for sponsoring this call. Uh, so to jump into the topic tonight, well, Rabbi Shays Tab, who is the Rabbi Relationship uh, ex uh, con uh, Counselor and an author of the AMI magazine, as well as an uh, author of several other books and articles and workshops and talks. Uh, so I'm very grateful that you're able to join us tonight. Thank you, Rabbi. So, uh, Thank you. Yeah. By the way, before we start, I just want to uh, mention I'm just getting over this flu that's going around. So if you hear me cough, that's just the remnant of that. And um, I'm uh, not 100% at my full energy level, but very, very happy to be on the call. And uh, everybody, be careful. Don't get this flu. It's a... It's a <laughs> really, really strong one. Just avoid it at all costs. That's my uh, free advice. <laughs> well, thank you. So I'm really grateful that you're able to make it today, and our call wasn't a few yeah, days. Hashem. No, I'm grateful to be on the call. Okay. So tonight's topic is a parenting as a team when your child is not following your derech. And there are families where this is really, this is really happening, where the child is not following the derech what the parents had hoped for. And when this happens, there's lots of emotions involved and different ideas of how to deal with it. And it's actually quite natural and even expected that two different people, the parents, would have differing opinions of what to do. I mean, they're two unique individuals, one's male, one's female. And depending if the child is a male or female, one has a little bit more familiarity with the system that the child may have been in or the challenges that face that particular gender. So it's kind of you know, almost natural that there would be differing opinions. But all too often we hear about families that are on such different pages that this is impacting the rest of the family. So, Rabbi yeah. Chow, I want to talk about different ways to address this particular, uh, different strategies and different ways that people are suggesting to deal with a mm -hmm. particular child. I want to focus a little bit more and stay closer to parenting as a team and Shalom right. Bayes in general. Excellent, yeah. Um, and that's a good approach because I think what often is ignored, and unfortunately it sets up a vicious cycle, when there is an obvious source of, let's say, a challenge in the home, which is, you know, a, a child who is not following the family's path, um, then all the focus tends to go on the, in that direction. And what happens is the other members of the family sort of fall by the wayside. And the parents even overlook themselves and their own relationship and um, what they need to be doing for themselves as individuals, meaning each one taking, you know, uh, taking care of himself or herself. And then next, I'd say in concentric circles emanating outward, then taking care of your spouse and then taking care of all of your other children. And then because all this, en this energy is going in the obvious direction, like, you know, I think they, they call it in medicine the identified patient, uh, you know, then, then all that focus is going in that direction and everyone else is sort of suffering, not even, just not by any uh, I intentional, uh, no, not by any, uh, you know, malicious, with any malicious intent, just, you know, by, by neglect, because the energy is, is going into that other direction, and then it creates strain, strain within the individual parent, and then in, in the marriage between the parents, and then in the relationships with the other children in the home, and then, of course, as the home becomes a, more, a place of more stress and more strain, this obviously... Uh, to, to, can only exacerbate and certainly doesn't do anything to, to improve the situation with the child who is having a hard time right now. And it sort of becomes a vicious cycle. Whereas um, if we can sort of 
say, you know, there, is, there are the efforts that we're making for this child, this child who, who needs extra help right now. But then at the same time, we're not going to neglect, we're not going to overlook what we need to be doing for the other children, for the marriage, for ourselves. Um, so that actually ends up being the opposite. That's, that's, that's a positive cycle that, will, that, that helps everyone, even the kid who is, is having a hard time right now. Because obviously uh, it's not a magic bullet, but the more positive energy in the home and the more healthy the relationships in the home around that child are, obviously that, that makes things easier, makes things better, makes it more attractive for the child to uh, come back to the, to the path of the family. Um, so before we even you know, get into the discussion of how this is done, I just want to agree with you or sort of agree with the initial premise that this is very important and it's, over, it's important precisely because it's overlooked and when it's overlooked, it just creates this, this loop that's really, you know, can be really devastating. So, yeah, Baruch Hashem, I'm glad that we're talking about it. Um, okay, so let's get into the actual the subject about focusing on maintaining peace in the home, maintaining peace in the marriage, parents being on the same page, being respectful of each other while dealing with this high-stress issue. I'm going to suggest that we take a look. Everything in life, we, we look to the Torah for our, for our guidance. Like the Rebbe said so many times, Torah is Torah's Chayim, the Torah of life. It guides us in life. Torah, Malash and Heira, in the word directive or instruction. There's a, a, there's a Parsha in the Torah, a section, that has a lot to teach us about parenting dynamics when dealing with a challenging child. And, and, and that is um, the section about the Menseir Umeida, about the stubborn and rebellious son. Now, before I say one more word, I just want to say, I think that is a, that is a, a subject that has often been I'd say misused. People read it they, very, uh, I'd say, on, on, on the surface. And they say, ah, there you go. He's a problem child. Got to get rid of him. You know, no mercy. Well, that's not really what the story is about. In fact, and I'm sure you've heard this, our sages say it never happened. Uh, if you learn in the Rambam about the... the, the various different legal details that are required in order for this to actually come to a case and then come to the point of the capital sentence. It's virtually impossible. And our sages say, indeed, that it, that it didn't happen. And then, of course, our sages ask a question, it being that it's, it's almost impossible to happen, and in history it hadn't happened, at least according to one, opinion in the Gemara, then why does the Torah write about it if it's academic? And uh, the Gemara answers that we should learn about it. That we should learn about it. There's a, a cautionary tale here. And contrary to, like I said, the surface reading, which is about this bad kid that you got to get rid of, it's actually not about a bad kid. And <laughs> It's actually not about getting rid of anybody. It's actually the opposite. It's a cautionary tale about a couple, about a married couple who is mishandling a stressful situation they're having with their child. And because of the mishandling, it ends up in a terrible way that the Torah doesn't want to happen to any child. I, I actually I, I wrote about this. There's a whole section in um, my book on recovery. This doesn't have to only pertain to recovery. I think for those who are dealing with uh, when, when addiction is involved, this becomes probably even more obvious 
how the dynamic uh, fits that situation. But uh, as it, 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 I think it applies to all situations. You'll see as, as, as we'll go through it. At any rate, but if, if anyone's interested in seeing it a little bit more spelled out, I do write about it in God of Our Understanding. Um, I forget which chapter because I'm not an expert in, in my own book. I know other people have come to me and told me, oh, you know that thing on page 53? I'm like, no, I don't know. I don't know what's on page 53. I don't. Sorry. Okay. But at any rate, uh, let's start from the beginning. Ben Seyre Omeida begins like this. Ki yele ish ben Seyre Omeida en ene shemaya bakel ovet vakel imay. All right. First thing, let me translate it. When, they're gonna, when there will be to a man, a son who is stubborn and rebellious, who does not listen to the voice of his mother and the voice of his father. Okay. First question is, who's this story about? So again, surface reading. Someone's going to say, oh, this is the story about the Ben Sayyid Ramayda. It's a story about a Ben Sayyid Ramayda. No, it's not. It's not what it says. It says, when there will be to a man a son who is stubborn and rebellious. It's not about the stubborn and rebellious son. He's secondary to the story. It's about a man. It's about a father. It's about a parent. The story is about a parent. The story is about parenting. It's not about the son. The son is incidental to the story. And each step of the way, we see how it's really the parents and their choices that exacerbate the situation. Each step of the way. It's not about the son. It's about the parents and the decisions that they're making. Okay. So that's, that's, first, that's first and foremost. That itself is a lesson. That itself is a lesson. When there's this drama going on in my life, it's very easy to feel like that everything is, that, I'll use the informal term, the craziness, the craziness, it's all coming from this kid. Well, actually, take a step back and stop. I'm sure there is pain that this child is feeling, and therefore, unwillingly or sometimes even unfortunately willingly this pain that's coming from that kid to those around him but really a lot of the drama if not well I would say a good part of the drama and a hundred percent of the drama that we can control is coming from ourselves if we're the, if we're the parents a good part of the stress and the, and the tension that's going on we are producing, and, and, and we can minimize. We are the principal actors in the narrative, not the son. And if you watch the story, this is, this is the story. This is the story about the parents making choices, the parents causing drama and whipping up the intensity of the situation. Okay, but first of all, let's look at the first thing. First thing, the first hint we already read. I already read it to you says that there is a stubborn and rebellious son, right? Ki yili ish ben seyre meyre, and then ish meyre bakel aviv vetel imay. He will not listen to the voice of his father or the voice of his mother. Boom. Right there, we have a big hint. We have a big hint of the source of the whole problem. Did you catch the detail? I think so. I don't want to put you on the spot with your biblical ex- exegetical skills. <laughs> but, well, what would you guess is a, is a, is a flag there? That they're separate, the father and the mother separately? Yeah, that's right. So the problem isn't that he's not listening to them. The problem is, he's, and, it, and, and in fact, the problem isn't that he's not listening to his father and his mother. The problem is those are two different things to listen or not listen to. That's why it says he does not listen He doesn't listen to the voice of his father and the voice of his mother. Voice here doesn't mean the the stimme. It doesn't mean the the, the sound of the person's uh, vocalizing. The voice means when you have a voice, when you speak from, from your principles. So the father is speaking, and he is um, standing for one set of principles. 
saying what is expected. And the mother has another set of principles, and she is setting a different set of expectations. So right there is the problem. That's the origin of all of the issues. Now, I might skip ahead. No, actually, let me just continue on the course. Okay. So then what happens next? The Sosavai of Ivimai. So his parents grab hold of him. They try to take control of the situation. And they take him to the elders of the city and to the gate. That means, you know, the prominent place. So they take him to the experts. I mean, this could be happening right now. It sounds familiar, yeah? So the parents take hold of him. Now, the fact that they're sending mixed messages... This isn't really, they're not aware of this. They're not aware that they're setting two different standards for the child to follow. All they're aware of, he's the problem. So they grab hold of him and they bring him to the experts. Now when they bring him to the experts, whoever those experts may be, they say to the elders of the city, they, they say to the experts, this son of ours is stubborn and rebellious. Okay? So the expert says, what's going on in the home? Tell me the situation. They say, I'll tell you the situation. This boy, he's stubborn and rebellious. Okay. So first of all, they start with telling about how the kid is the problem. They're not talking about the the part that they're playing in it, which, again, I want to make clear, they're not causing the problem. I'm not saying the parents made the kid this way, but I'm saying where does the drama, the drama means fomenting it, exacerbating it, where does that begin? Whatever the condition is, the condition is. Whatever the child's going through and will have to, have to overcome, that's one thing. But now I'm talking about the drama that's being built up around all that. Is that clear that I'm trying to differentiate two different things here? I mean, the, the, I see the yeah, I see the clarity in it. Okay, so now they talk to the experts and actually say, "What's the problem?" They say, "It's this kid, stubborn and rebellious." A nanu shemeya bokeleinu. He doesn't listen to our voice. Zayla would say that he's a glutton. He's a gazda. Now, what did they just do there when they told the story to the experts? When they said, He doesn't listen to our voice. What, is, what happened there? I mean, we already know from before that there was a Kail Aviv and there's a Kail Imai. But now they're saying, when they're talking to the experts, he doesn't listen to our voice. What do you mean our voice? There wasn't, there isn't our voice. Now, are the parents trying to look good in front of the experts? Not necessarily. Probably they're not even aware. They're probably not even aware that they're doing this. They probably haven't stopped to think. To, to be Malamed Sus, they're probably so preoccupied with the stress of dealing with, with this child and the pain that they have for this child, that they haven't actually stopped and thought about the fact that mom and dad are telling the kid two different things, giving two different uh, sets of expectations, um, sending two different sets of, of, of messages as far as what's okay and what's not okay what's acceptable, what's unacceptable. And now when they come to the experts, how do they explain it? They say he doesn't listen to our voice. Well, if that were true, we'd have another discussion. But there is no our voice. <coughs> so the trainer is telling us something here. That, and, and, and it's going to 
be a downward spiral from here. It's not a pretty story. Thank God, like, like I said, the Talmud says, at least according to one opinion, this never happened. But even studying it as a hypothetical example, it's a, it's a terrible tragedy. It's a downward spiral. And, but where does a downward spiral really take off? Like I said, the, the, the origin of it is there's two different voices in the home. And then where that is exacerbated is when the parents start to bring in the expert help and then the parents tell the experts perhaps even completely innocently he's not listening to to the rules of our home well if that were true if there were one unified code if there were one spirit if there were one uh, set of expectations there will be another discussion but really what we're talking about is parents being on, the, on, on, on two different pages. And this is going to exacerbate and foment the whole drama that then um, unfolds. And what happens? And the, the next verse tells us that uh, the, the, the Ben Sayer and Maire meets this, uh, this, terrible, this terrible end. I mean, thank God, again, it's a hypothetical case. But there is, and, and, and the Gemara tells us it's to teach us a lesson. What's the lesson? Well, there are many lessons, but one of them is we started with a stubborn and rebellious son. We ended with the worst possible outcome. How did that happen? Unfortunately, it happened when Again, like I said, the story is not a story about a son. The story is a story about a father. The story happened, or it, 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 it unfolded, unfortunately, in the way that it did. But we have the parents, perhaps because, again, they're overly focused, as is right, rightfully understandable, they're overly focused on this child as a point of stress, but they're overlooking the fact they're overlooking what they should be doing for themselves, for the marriage, for the family, and with that oversight, it leads, and the Torah is being very, very, uh, I'd say, grim, and to maybe perhaps to get our attention here in this hypothetical situation, that this is how it falls apart and becomes the absolute worst outcome. So it is a, it's a severe cautionary tale to us to stop and to ask ourselves, hold on a second. The Torah wants us to think. Can I control the fact that I have a stubborn and rebellious son? Maybe not. Maybe not. But one thing I can control, I can control, I can control, if he's not listening, at least let him not listen to both of us simultaneously. That I can control. But when he's not listening to both of us separately because we're on two different pages. This is what causes the drama. This is what causes the discord, the misunderstanding, and, and the, 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 the terrible end that the Ben Sayyidah Maida has in, in, in the Torah. In, in the end, again, the mother says it never happened, but technically if it were to have happened, says the parents themselves have, have to administer the sentence. What parents in the world could bring themselves to administer the sentence? The parents in the world could bring themselves to do it. They wouldn't be able to do it. But, but, but the thing is, again, it's cautioning us, it, obviously, with, with very, uh, with, with, with very, a very attention-getting scenario that this is where it begins. This is where it starts. So we want to stop want to, even, even with all the stress that's going on, you know, even with the bombs that are going off, with the distraction that the, the child's daily rebellion may be creating in the home, but it's, it's vital, it's vital to stop and for mother and father to get together and to say, listen, we cannot control how the, our son or our daughter, for that matter, could very well be a daughter, is responding to us. But let's make sure between you and I that whatever it is that we are telling to this child and to all of our children, 
is a consistent voice, that there is a koilainu, not just when we're talking to the experts and, and we say it the way we wish it were, that there's a unified voice. Let's make sure that there's a, unif- a unified voice. And then the Torah is, is, is telling us, once you have, once you remove that component, then we're not going to go down that road. And it's not going to spiral into that terrible tragedy of the, of the, of the terrible hypothetical case of the Ben Seder and Reba. So that's just one thing, I think, um, is important to... Uh, it's important to, to focus on. Because the Torah has already warned us that in a situation like this, the, the highest likelihood for us to add to the drama is going to be division between parents and then from the negative we can infer the positive that in order to stave off, to stop, and hopefully even to turn around the situation, um, our best bet is getting together, getting that unified voice. If we can possibly do so, to humble ourselves and to say that although we didn't ask for such a Messiah, that perhaps this is Hashem's way, a very difficult way of asking us to have deep conversations about what our values are, what our principles are. You know, every couple on Shidduchim, at least hopefully, I hope they still do, every couple on Shidduchim, they discuss what are the values that they want their family to have. And then, you know, 10 years, 20 years married, not necessarily do these conversations happen so often. But a situation like this, ideally they should. Ideally, you know, the half an hour a day of chinuch that we're supposed to think about, that Rabbi Rashab spoke about it, brought in the Hayyim, yeah, in a half an hour a day, thinking about chinuch. Ideally, yeah, we would be discussing our values. What do we stand for? What is this family about? What are, what are, what's, what's important to us? How do we want to see each other being treated in our home? What, 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 what are the ways that we talk to each other? What are the ways that we behave? What are the expectations we have for, for every member of the family who lives under this roof? Things like that. Often those conversations aren't had, but if we can humbly accept the Nisoyim that perhaps you know, Hashem is giving us an opportunity to have an honest and deep and meaningful conversation about these values and get that unifi- unified voice. Again, doesn't mean it's a magic bullet that's going to turn everything around for this kid who's going through a hard time right now. But what it does mean is, A, it's not going to exacerbate the situation and lead to the drama like the stubborn and rebellious son. And B, it's going to make the home more stable and more of an attractive place for this son or this daughter to, to, to return to when they have worked through whatever it is they need to work through. So that's a long answer to your first question. <laughs> yes, well, I think that's a very important, covered a, a lot of important points. Just to build uh, on that a little bit is that when there's peace in the home, it makes it easier for the other children because we hear these stories where like, one parent has one approach and the other parent has another approach, and then the other siblings have to kind of figure out where they fit into this whole approach. Like if one parent decides that he doesn't want to talk to this child and tells all the children not to talk, but the other parent says you should, you know, and so like the kid, the other kids are torn between. So this unified voice is not only important for the spouse, uh, for the two spouses, and for this child who's having this difficult time, but for everybody. So, I mean, we see that all the time where the, the other kids are confused. And that causes a whole new set of problems. Correct. And whatever the... the, the uh, okay, first of all, not every conversation that mother and father have together, obviously, this, this goes without saying, but things that go without saying sometimes need to be said. That not everything that mother and father discuss about how they're dealing with this, with the, the, the son or daughter who's struggling right now, not all the aspects of that conversation have to be revealed to the other children. It's just simply not their concern or their worry. Um, however, when it comes to action, when it comes to, you know, mice and the pile, then, yeah, there has to be a unified set of expectations as far as how we are acting toward each other, 
including the, the, the particular child who's struggling right now. And again, there are so many approaches, and I don't think the purpose of this call is to discuss which No, I don't want to go to the different approaches at all. Yeah, good. So my, my, my point here is whatever approach it is, but that has to be something that you and your spouse are very clear about, that this is what you're doing. And, and even if you have misgivings, you can discuss those with each other. And if you have hesitations, doubts, you can discuss them with each other. But when it comes to actual mice of the pearl, consistency is the key. With any approach, consistency, 100% consistency is, is the key. And, and as far as the other children being in on it, they don't have to understand all the inner workings, but the bottom line as far as the behaviors that are going to be expected now. Again, consistency, consistency is the key. And those other children who are members of the home, they can't be consistent if they don't know what the, what the rules are. So that has to be clear for everybody. I want to me- mention one other thing. Sometimes it's very different. Yeah. Go ahead. Go ahead. Yeah, so I mention one other thing about the other, the other children. Go ahead. Okay. Another thing about the other children is that very often the other siblings, typically it's a younger sibling, but it could even be, I've, I've seen it where it's, it's an older sibling, because of the emotional, um, because of the, the, the emotional drain that the one particular child's struggles are, are putting on the family, other children get overlooked. And depending on how long the situation persists for, sometimes years, there is often a child who misses out on a lot of attention for a prolonged period of time. And I know that a lot of people ask the question about, you know, in a house, when one child goes off, you know, does it, is it contagious? Does it spread to the others? And, and there's no one answer for that because I don't think there's one way in which that happens. There are many different scenarios how it can spread in the family or it can, sometimes it's not spreading. It's, this, and this is what I want to say, is sometimes another child, there was an completely unintentional, completely unintentional on part of the parents. And you can totally understand why it happened and how it happened because the parents were being so taxed dealing with this other child. But, a younger sibling, and like I said, it could even sometimes be an older sibling, ends up getting the short end of the deal. And that can very well end up manifesting in the same types of problems that you're dealing with already with the first kid. Although not necessarily does it manifest as, you know, problems of rebellion or going away from Yiddishkeit, but it, it, it does leave a mark. It does leave a mark. And I think that a person should assume, a person should just assume that if you have a child who's requiring a lot of extra emotional energy from you right now, you should just assume no matter what objective uh, calculation or or evaluation that you're, you're making of your own situation, you should assume that your other children, by definition, are already not getting as much attention as they normally would. Even if you think that they are, even if you think it's not affecting them, just assume that every other kid in the house is not getting as much attention as they should be because you're being emotionally taxed dealing with this special situation. And therefore, as hard as this is to say when a parent is already being emotionally taxed and you're going to say, but my, I, have no, I have no reserves right now. I'm spent. And now you're telling me, oh, my other kids also need extra attention? And I'm going to tell you, yeah, your other kid, Dafka, right now need extra attention. <laughs> what I would say is, going back to the Ben Seder and about, and I hope the distinction was clear about there's the pain that's going on, 
and then there's the drama that's being built on, on top of the pain. If you want to know where you can get some emotional energy reserves, if you can isolate the drama, the energy that you're putting into creating drama, I know no one thinks they're doing it because if you knew you were doing it, you wouldn't do it. But if you can isolate the energy that you're misappropriating and creating drama on top of the already difficult situation, then you have this, you, you discover this, this extra energy reserve that you didn't know about. This is the energy that you were misappropriating that you get back, and now you have it to spend on, on the other kids who are certainly in need of extra attention right now. Where is this extra energy reserve going to come from? So like I was, I was talking about before, <coughs> The story of the Ben Sayyid really, really makes it clear for us. There's the, there's, the, there's the one issue, which is there's a son who's not listening. But then on top of it, there's another issue. There's the drama the parents are creating. What's the drama the parents are creating? Well, like we said, they're both telling them what to do, but they're not on the same page. So right, right there, just getting rid of that, getting rid of that discord in the house is going to free up some energy. You'd be amazed how much energy it takes out of you to uh, say something and then have it unsaid by somebody else, even who's not even purposely trying to uh, thwart you. Also, what does it say? They grab hold of him. They grab hold of him. They take him to the, to the, 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 the elders of the city. What is it, what's, with, what's with the grabbing? Why the grabbing? Where they grab it. Guide him. Talk to him. They're trying to control him. Okay, we can't control other people, not even our children. We can educate, we can guide, we can inspire. We can tell them what our boundaries are. We can say, here's what I'm going to do. Here are my rules. You know, I can say, I lock the door at 11 p.m. and I'm not opening it. I'm going to bed. That's what I'm doing. You're saying my behavior. You can always say your behaviors, but you can't tell someone else their behavior. You can't say, you will be home at 11 p.m. Well, maybe they will, maybe they won't. I just use that as an example. But the point is, again, you want to free up some energy. Where is some of this energy being misspent? Well, any energy you're spending on trying to control somebody else's behavior, that's for sure misspent energy. It's not energy that's being spent well. Because I, free choice means I get to make choices for what I do. Free choice doesn't mean that I'm free to choose what you're going to do. And if I'm busy choosing what you ought to do, I'm wasting my energy. So I can, get, I can free up a lot of misspent energy by, 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 by letting go of that, that, the controlling, focusing more on um, being about here's what I stand for, here are, or not just what I stand for, here's what the family stands for, here's what values we have, here are our expectations, and just being firm about that without playing that chess game of trying to figure out how what I've just said is going to elicit a particular behavior from, from the other person. You know, how, how you choose to respond to what I've said, I have no control. I don't say what I say in order to elicit a specific response. I'm saying what I'm saying. Why? Because these are the principles that this home operates on. These are the principles that we believe in. Well, so why am I saying it? I'm saying because this is our truth. That's it. You put it out there. You're done. No more expenditure of energy. And then you'd be amazed how much extra energy you have now. And you can spend it with that younger kid who had been uh, overlooked because you were emotionally taxed dealing with a you know, special situation right now. Uh, I was in the middle of talking about uh, something else. I sort of got off, uh, off topic. So I would think that another way to, the, to kind of save some of your energy is to, is to go to so, get insight from somebody else, especially if the two parents are on different pages and have different views about what should they should be doing. So to get you know, support, whether it's a mashpia or a therapist who knows, how, who knows how to 
deal with such situations. Yeah, and also support for yourself. Meaning, let's say even you have support as far as the parenting piece of it. So you know your plan. Okay, fine, there's having a plan, and then there's dealing with the rest of life while you're implementing this difficult-to-implement plan. You know, it's like, see this always talks about uh, being happy. Well, why, why should you be happy? The Alta Rebbe says in, in Tanya that it's like a wrestler. This wrestler is better prepared, and he's stronger, and he's, he's better trained. But he wasn't happy, so he lost his meat against a, uh, an inferior opponent. The so same type of thing. <laughs> Let's say you have your parenting approach laid out for you. So you have someone who's guiding you on that, and you know what you're supposed to do. Okay, but when you're not happy, meaning when other things in life, you know, the, the life is interesting, life is complex, there's more than one thing going on at a time. So when other things are getting to you, just regular life, regular difficulties and challenges of life, and you're not dealing well with that, and then you're, you're stressed out. Now think about how hard it makes it to do the stuff you need to be doing, that you know you need to be doing, you want to be doing regarding sticking with parenting this child. So as far as getting help for yourself, having someone to talk to, whether, it, whether it's peers or it's a, it's a mashpia or it's professional help, um, that's, think of that as that's in order to keep me in my top condition. That's in order to keep me healthy and upbeat so that I'm not carrying extra weight and being slowed down when I have to move along and exercise the, the various uh, methods in parenting that I have to do in order to deal with this difficult child. You want to take care of, you to take care of yourself. You want to make sure whatever it is that, that, that you need, that that's not weighing down on you. Just like this always explains, it's like you can have the perfect approach to serving Hashem, and you can have all the advantages. But if life is weighing down on you, and you're not reacting well, and you're not dealing well, then you're not going to implement the plan, the path that the, the trader has given us. But when you are feeling good and when you are dealing well with life, then, then, it's, then it's a piece of cake. You're not a piece of cake, but <laughs> then you do, you, you do much better. You, you produce consistently better results. Yeah. I'm also thinking that some of the, some of the things that I hear that are like where the conflict comes from is where one parent kind of tells the other that it's because of you, or you know, it's you, what you did to him when he was or her when she was younger. So how can you work past that? Yeah. Well, that's a very good question because that's very serious. First of all, who can know a thing like that? Who can know a thing like that? Um, human beings are so complex. And it's, it's such a combination of nature and nurture and so many different factors that make us who we are and our own free choice and and the story that Hashem has planned for each of us. You know, two exact same events can happen to two different people and have completely different outcomes. Obviously, we want to parent our children perfectly, and none of us do. You know, I'll share with you a vort, by the way. Um, there's a bracha that a, that a father makes on the day of the bar mitzvah of his son. Um, and the minig chabad, the bracha, baruch shetarani, blessed is you who now exempts me 
from taking responsibility for this for this child. Now the child's responsible for himself as an adult. And uh, many Chabad is that we don't make that bracha b'shem malchus. Others do. Most others do make the bracha with shame and malchus. And so a reason for that. The reason for that is it's true that now the child is 13 or, or daughter is 12 um, and they are a bardas and they can make their own decisions and I'm not responsible anymore for their decisions. My minor child of a cotton or katana makes bad decisions. That's my problem to deal with. Once they're an adult, they make their own decisions. They, they, they deal with it themselves. They want my help. They can ask me, but I'm not obligated. When is that so, however? When is that so? If they started with an even playing field, if they were given a fair shot. However, if anything in the chinuch they received from me is deficient, where I didn't give them a fair chance getting started as an adult, and they make a poor choice because of some deficiency in the chinuch that I gave them, well, then I am responsible. I am very much at fault for that. And that's why we don't make a bracha baruch shet parani. That's why we don't. That's why we make the bracha, but we don't make with shem malchus because of that, that doubt, or rather that certainty that we truly missed something that we should have given, we could have given better to our children. Interestingly, by the rebbeim, however, they did make the bracha b'shem malchus. And the answer for that, to why that is so, is, is obvious, because the chinuch from a Rebbe is, is perfect. So whatever a Rebbe gave his son was 100% whatever the son needed, and now the son is really on his own, carrying no baggage of any deficiencies from his childhood. But for the rest of us, for the rest of us, everyone was missing something in their chinuch. Okay, so now let's just get that out of the way. Everybody, I saw a statement recently, nobody emerges from childhood unscathed. Sounds sort of pessimistic, but uh, but there's, there's a truth to it. Okay. So let's say nobody emerges from childhood unscathed and, and, and that many times what we're lacking from our childhood was something that our parents or one of, one of our parents uh, did wrong, could have done better. Okay, fine. So that's the situation. At this point, now, you're talking about a child who's a teenager or, 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 or even in their 20s. And we're going to go back and start to analyze and dissect where it all came from, and where it all started to go wrong. The first thing I want to say is I don't think that that itself is productive. How can we know? And, and why is it important at this point? If one parent feels that it was another parent's fault, that the child is the way that they are today, I'm sorry to say, but I do not think that that is a productive discussion. I do not think that's a productive discussion. We can't know that it's true. Um, there's nothing to do about it anymore. It, 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 it's, it's hurtful, it's accusatory, and it's only going to cause a rift between the parents, which takes us back to what we were talking about at the very beginning of the call. It's the diversity of two different voices from the parents add drama on top of the already stressful situation. Now, conversely, having said all that, that's what rabbis do, right? Having said all that, now I want to say the exact opposite. No, but not the exact opposite. But what, I, what I do want to say is <coughs> there is such a thing as you live and you learn. And we all know that we experiment on our older children. Everybody knows that. As, as a firstborn, I mean, I can talk that myself. That, you know, 
We experiment on our older children until we get it right or until we get too tired to do anything and then the little kids, you know, the youngest kids just get to do whatever they want because we're too tired and then somehow it ends up okay because <laughs> somehow we don't uh, interfere too much and everything ends up fine. But if there is some insight to be gained regarding either A, raising of other children currently right now in the home, then that's a valuable discussion. Or B, if it has to do with the ongoing, in the present now, relationship between this parent and this child, then it could be a discussion. But never this um, theoretical um, history about well, it was because you, whatever. Never. That's something, it's just not for one parent to work through with another parent, and, and I'm not even sure with, with whom. Maybe one parent with the guidance of, of a professional. But again, that's not what we're talking about. If it is, uh, I'll repeat the two instances where it, it, is, it, is, it is pertinent. If it's a lesson to be learned about children that are still in the home, if there's a mistake that was made and one parent can respectfully and compassionately, compassionately, compassionately point it out to the other spouse and say, I feel like you could even say we, even if it was all the other parent, could have done such and such more or different with child A. Can we really be vigilant about doing this for child B and C and D? That would be useful. And then the second scenario, like I said, I'm repeating, is if it is pertinent to the ongoing here and now relationship with this child. So it may be that whatever was missing from, from so the, the child who's struggling right now, whatever's missing from that childhood, we, we can't go back and fix that. We can't undo it. But we can make sure that that's not part of the present relationship. And, and don't underestimate the power that healing the present relationship has. Whatever closeness can be, can be forged under the current situation is obviously for the benefit of everyone involved. Oh, I hope that, that's answering yeah. the question. Similarly, um, sometimes when they kind of do that contemplation and reflection, like where this might have come from, whether they do it even individually, or they're in the conversations with their child, or come to their awareness that something happened to this child that can seem so overwhelming, so much to deal with. I know some cases where the parents just felt too overwhelmed and couldn't deal with it and just didn't deal with it. And yeah. I, I don't think that that's too helpful either. Can you talk to that a little bit? Well, yeah, when there's a kid who is clearly struggling, um, that does often happen that as you're looking into things, you become aware that, that a child has gone through more than than what you realized. And it could be that they experienced some form of abuse or an, uh, an other trauma. There are other traumas as well. And um, by the way, I think now today... It's people are so aware of abuse, which is, is a good thing, but I think people have forgotten a little bit about other things that can happen in a childhood that can, you know, really shake up a child if not dealt with properly. So, you know, don't, don't forget that well, all types of things can happen to a young person that are, that are devastating. And... If a child doesn't have a way of dealing with it, yes, can very easily 
lead to them uh, sort of rebelling and, and being angry and even like I said being uh, being being very contentious why that's the pain that's the pain that they're feeling so if something like that comes out first thing is just to breathe parents have to breathe if it's not something happening right now if it's not a present situation and it's old history already but just breathe meaning there's nothing to do about it now it's already it's already happening I mean it's, it's already happened it's already you know it's already part of the past and now after you're aware of it you have to deal with it how to deal with it call a professional don't don't just try to wing it don't just uh, casually next time you see the kid make an awkward first attempt at bringing it up there's a right way there's a wrong way there get get yourself guidance and deal with it and and certainly I, I understand the, the, the you know the feeling of being too overwhelmed to want to go there but here's the here's the thing if you're already dealing with a child who's rebelling you're already there you're already seeing the symptoms of this this trauma so to get to the heart of it and to try if, if at all possible to ease that burden and to, to heal some of that wound that that, that should only be that's not going to make things more difficult for you or for the child I think first and foremost you have to consider the child it's not going to make things more difficult for the child actually helping them and should do, you should just see it as as part of your uh, part of your tasks see it more you know like a technical thing like this is a this is a to-do list this is something that I have to do so I'm going to do it dispassionately try to take emotion out of it because again if it's in the past it's in the past there's no use um, getting worked up now take care of it right sometimes people get really really emotional and then that's a substitute for doing anything you get really emotional and you feel like you've responded to the issue because you cried and you screamed and you know you you didn't sleep for three days but that's not really dealing with it it's better you should have no emotional reaction and just deal with it the best you can than uh, you know have a extremely emotional response where you know actuality the mice of a pile following through in any type of way that would actually benefit the child never happens and just to add to that I mean if you're overwhelmed right when you hear the news or whatever you hear what happened I mean, if it happened four years ago, so four years and two more days is okay if you need time to, like, let it settle and to think it through. You don't have to deal with it that morning that you hear that morning, I would think. Absolutely. When I said just breathe first, I didn't mean just one breath. You could actually <laughs> sleep on it. You could sleep on it for two nights. Don't sleep on it for too long because then, you know, human nature is we just let things go yeah. on and on. Yeah. And just one thing, one more thing. I've, you can just talk to it as we as we wrap it up. Uh, for some families, they they take it personally, and they the or for some, for some parents, even grandparents, that this child is ruining their family name, uh. or you know, or their or their or their siblings' uh, shidduch prospects, and so they get yeah. their emotions come from that angle. Could you talk to that a little bit? Yeah. Well, first of all, first thing I would say, I don't know. See, I'm not talking to any individual right now. We're speaking in general. So I would have to judge the individual. But if I felt the individual could hear it and not shut down, I would say that I think that's kind of heartless. Um, nobody is 
No kid is going off the derech for, for, the, for the fun of it. They're not doing it for kicks. They're having a difficult time. Um, that doesn't excuse all of their behavior. Not an excuse, but for you to say, well, they're, they're ruining the family name, they're making shidduchim difficult for the other kids. Okay, I hear that, I understand that, but hold on a second. You know, let's, let's first things first. You worried for your other kids? Okay, but you also have to be worried for this kid. This kid is going through, through something painful. Where's the compassion for that, for that child? I guarantee you they're not willingly um, trying to hurt the family. And, 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 and if you say, and I've heard people very seldomly, but I have heard where people say, yes, actually, I think they do actually have a special, you know, uh, malicious thrill hurting the family name. Then I would say, okay, so then think about how hurt by the family they must feel that they somehow think that's necessary. Again, it's not an excuse. I'm not saying it in order to excuse the behavior. I'm saying it in order for the parent to understand that if you want to feel compassion, you know, you, 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 feel, you feel a pity for the, for the family name and for the other children and for their reputation, okay. But also, what's, where's the pity for this child who's going through, through such a difficult time? So that's, that's the first thing is try to find that place of compassion in your heart, okay? It's not going to help to see this child as your enemy. It's really not going to help. It's not going to help to see them as someone who's making your life difficult. Whether it's about this thing, about, you know, ruining the family name and should become difficult for the other kids, or about anything in life, just about, you know, what do I need this for? What do we need this extra stress? This child is just making my life difficult. I promise you, it's not going to make your life any better. It's not going to add peace to your life one bit to regard this child as, as an adversary. Find a soft place in your heart. Find the compassion. Again, I was talking about the Ben Sayyid Ramayda. That whole terrible, terrible hypothetical situation, it only comes to the tragedy in the end that it does because the parents actually have to carry out that death sentence because they can't find that soft place in their heart. But even to the very end, they're still angry about their lack of control over that child. That's part of the warning that Joe was giving us in that story. So go back and find a place of compassion. Have some pity on this child. Now, having said that, you want to talk about uh, family name, you want to talk about reputation, you want to talk about the other kids. Honestly, I hate to say it, but in today's day and age, it's understood. Maybe 30, 40 years ago it was different, even 20 years ago it was different. In today's day and age, it's understood. Mm-hmm understood what's going on in the world today. You know, it's very easy to feel like I'm the only one who has these terrible problems. I'm the only one whose family has these dark secrets. You know what? You're not. There are two kinds of people in the world. There are normal people and there are people who you actually know. (laughs) And you get to know anybody in anybody's family Everybody's got problems. Everyone's got challenges. We're all struggling with stuff. Nobody's perfect. It's okay. Everyone's got their baggage. And you're going to see, if you really look, if you, if you be objective and calm down, that families who are dealing with different issues, even issues that are public or somewhat public, you know, the family still continue to live and, 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 and make 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 customers and you know go go to Brisson from eight o'clock and, and, and do all the things that, that families do. And uh, it's not the end of the world. Don't be a teenager. <laughs> and don't over over dramatize. All right, this has been great. You covered a lot of important points, a lot to think about, a lot to kind of 
de-emphasize the craziness and the drama that some people add and to really deal with this situation and work with the rest of the family. So this is very important. The recording is available for everybody uh, at adayad, A-D-H-I-A-D dot org slash past dash events. And if you have any questions on this topic specifically, you can email us anonymously at adayad.org slash ask dash anonymous dash question or directly at info at adayad.org. Um, and we'll try to address it either um, privately or in a future conference call or article. So once again, thank you, Rabbi Tab. You gave a very important perspective around this very important topic. And I'm really glad that we didn't touch on specific strategies, but really stayed focused on dealing with the family situation. Because I think that people talk about strategies all the time, but somehow the family gets lost and the marriage relationship gets lost in all of that talk. So I'm glad that we covered that from this angle. So Yeah, Baruch Hashem. Thanks, thanks for making it possible. Okay. Thank you all and good night. Feel better. Thank you. <laughs>